And with that, we are at our last session for today. Uh, it's been a very exciting day. Um, and for our last speaker, uh, I would love to introduce him. Uh, he is an assistant professor of biomedical data science at Stanford University. He was also the faculty director for uh, Stanford AI for Health and has received the Sloan Fellowship, NSF Career Award, Chan Zuckerberg Investigator Award, and faculty awards from Google, Tencent, and Amazon, and several papers at top CS venues. Please, well, please join me in welcoming James Zhu. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, RD. Very excited to be here. Very nice to meet all of you. I'm James So. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford. And uh, today I'll be telling you about some of the work that we're doing on a data-centric perspective to interpretable and trustworthy AI. So I want to start with actually two examples based on the work that we've been doing recently on examples of where machine learning models actually broke to motivate why we want to take this data-centric perspective towards trustworthy AI. So the first example comes from looking at large language models. So we're looking here at GPT-3, which is one of these large language models which have generated a ton of excitement. And I'm going to play for you a video of my PhD student, Abu Bakr, interacting with this large language model. So here, Abu entered this text prompt to Muslims, and the rest of the text is automatically created by this AI system. And what you find here is that the text generated AI associates Muslims with strong violence. Right? In this case, it says they slaughtered 85 people. And we can put in different prompts. Right? So the algorithm will generate different texts, but that will still associate Muslims with violence. And finally, you know, Abu got fed up and wrote explicitly that they worked in to worship peacefully, but the model was not deterred and said that they were shot dead for their faith. Right. So in this particular case, this very powerful state-of-art model clearly exhibits the very problematic biases and stereotypes. And this is a very systematic trend. Right? So we designed probes to quantify this, and in 70% of the instances, right, the texts that are generated by this GPT-3 model would associate Muslims with some notion of violence. And we've similarly quantified different other stereotypes the model has for other religious, ethnic, and gender groups. So this is a very vivid example of a setting where this state-of-art AI system broke uh, because it has these stereotypes and biases. So the second example of where the model broke that I want to share with you um, is looking at applications in healthcare. Right. Um, so there's a lot of excitement about developing AI systems for healthcare, and a lot of the excitement is centered around, actually around dermatology applications. Right. So for example, Google and many other companies are interested in, in launching AI tools that can help patients to diagnose based on their photos. And typically how these tools will work is that you take this input, right, some photo you can take with your phone, in this case, this photo of this legion here, and you put that photo into the algorithm, and the algorithm will automatically classify whether this is uh, a melanoma or uh, it's a benign image. Right? In this case, it says, oh, this is a melanoma, which is a very serious, it's a type of cancer, and that you should visit the dermatologist as soon as possible. Right, so these kinds of tools could be super exciting for healthcare applications that can improve the care of, of skin diseases um, and could be really transformative for, for healthcare and for medicine. So we wanted to take a closer look at these algorithms. Right, so the algorithms all report quite strong performance in their original papers, original publications. Right? In this particular case, this algorithm that we looked at had accuracy performance AUC above 0.9, which is quite good. So to assess their performance, we created a new data set. Right? Uh, so Roxana, who's an excellent postdoc in my group, so she helped to lead the effort to create this diverse skin data set based on medical records that we have here curated from Stanford. Um, and we took these algorithms, several of the state-of-art models, and then applied them off the box to our new Stanford data sets. And we were very surprised that the performance of these models really cratered, right? It, the, accuracy, the AUC dropped from 0.9 to 0.6. And the big mystery here is what actually happened. Why did the performance of these state-of-art models drop so much when it's applied to our Stanford data set? I should also be clear that Stanford data set is not really adversarial at all, right? It's really data collected from real-world 
patients. So what I want to do is to I'll come back at the end of the presentation to describe what actually happened in this particular case. Right? So what are the factors that contributed to this mysterious drop in the model's performance um, for dermatology AI applications? But before I do that, I want to sort of take you through this uh, more general framework for thinking about more holistically about what, how to design AI systems to make them more reliable, more trustworthy. And to do that, I think it's really important to take this you know, data-centric perspective, right? So especially if, as we were thinking about you know, taking machine learning models from the sandbox research and development stage into actual deployment to patients or to customers, right? I think one of the biggest challenges that we run into is that if we really want to understand how are these AI systems going to behave and their properties, we really need to understand what is the data that goes into training and to testing these algorithms. Right. And those data, as we think about deployment, can come from this very messy real world data. In this case, for example, from patients, or in the case of GPT 3, you know, it comes from large text corpora. And this is why it's very important to take, uh, a have a more systematic framework to understand you know, what are the potential issues with the data and how, this, how to build systems that are more reliable. So in the next 15 or so minutes, I want to take you through this uh, framework that we developed based on these three steps. Right, so these are basically the three questions that I would want to ask for looking at sort of how to into building a system that's more trustworthy and more reliable in deployment. Um, so the first question we want to ask is, you know, so what is the actual data that went into training and to testing these particular AI models? Right. As we saw in the two examples that I started with, right, for the AI dermatology and the GPT-3, right, so a lot of the issues uh, and challenges of these models can come from what is it put into the training data set and also to the evaluation data sets. So that's the first step. So the second step is that now that we quantified, right, once we quantified what is the data that used to train and to test the model, we would like to understand more precisely how the different parts of the data or different types of data contribute to the model's success or mistakes. Right? So if the model has certain biases, has exhibits certain stereotypes or makes mistakes, we want to understand what data actually led to those mistakes. And third component is really thinking about how do we test and audit these models much more rigorously using human in the loop type of uh, analysis and, 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 um, and evaluations. Okay, so the first part to characterize the landscape of data behind these AI algorithms. So what I'll do is I'll keep this dermatology setting as sort of a running example, but a lot of the techniques and the ideas we've described here can be applied in other settings like commerce or finance or consumer applications. All right, so I think a big challenge is to, first we want to understand that what is the data that used to, that goes into training and to testing the, many of the state-of-the-art AI models. So for the dermatology AI example that I mentioned before, right? So what we did here is that we actually did a systematic survey, uh, which is summarized in this figure of what is the data that's used to train each of the AI dermatology algorithms. So what we're showing here is that each box corresponds to one AI model, right? So, um, and each circle corresponds to one data set. So you see two different colors of circles, right? So you have the red circles, which those indicates that the data set is a private data set. So that means that people otherwise can have very lim limited access or no access to that data set. And then the blue, the green circles corresponds to public data sets, which are often used to train or to benchmark these models, right? And we're showing you with these connecting lines, right? Which algorithm used which data sets. So there's a lot, a lot of interesting patterns that we can discover by looking at these visualizations. Right, so first thing to notice that so there's a couple of benchmark data sets, like for example, this data, data set that's one here, which is a public data set, which is used by any of the, uh, of the models for testing and for training. On the other hand, there's a large number of dermatology AI algorithms right, in, the, in the top half of the plot, which are mostly trained or tested on a small number of private data sets. Right. So the circle of the data set uh, indicates or the size of the circle corresponds to how much data is in that data set, right? So a lot of these algorithms are only tested and trained on relatively small data sets, and these are also not publicly available. And that's 
can be quite problematic, right? Because it would be very difficult for auditors or for reviewers or for other machine learning developers to really assess how good these algorithms are because they are trained and validated on private data sets uh, that are relatively small and that cannot be accessed by other researchers. Right, so I think these kinds of data maps showing what data goes into training what algorithms will be really important across all sorts of different domains of applications of AI. Right, so here I'm showing you how we built this data map for AI dermatology applications. And it's also really important, I think it's just as important to build it for many of the other applications. So here's another example based on some of our recent works where we similarly investigated what data went into testing and evaluating FDA approved medical AI systems. Right, so the reason why this is interesting is that because people typically think about FDA as being sort of the gold standard of evaluations. Right? So for these you know, COVID vaccines or for cancer treatments, they all have to be approved by the FDA before they're used on patients. And in the last few years, there's also an increasing number of AI devices that are approved by the FDA to be used on patients. And here we wanted to survey what was the data that went into testing these devices before they obtained their FDA approvals. So each symbol here corresponds to one of these medical AI devices as approved by the FDA. There's 130 of them altogether. I've shown them as being stratified by which body part they apply to. Right, so maybe the most important information to keep in mind here is the circle uh, or is, is the, the color of the symbol, right? So the, it's colored blue here. If that uh, device reported testing data from multiple locations, otherwise it's colored gray, right? So the gray ones are basically data medical AI devices, which only reported evaluation data from one location, like one hospital or one university. And it's actually very striking, quite surprising to us that a substantial number, about 90 over, out of the 130 approved FDA, FDA approved medical AI devices did not report evaluation data from multiple locations. And the reason why that's quite surprising and quite important is that as machine learning developers, we know very well that the performance of a model can vary substantially across different locations. Right, so the example that I gave in the beginning about dermatology is, is a good case of this, right? The performance can be very high on one data set, but when I applied them here at Stanford, the performance dropped off quite a bit, right? And this could be a very general problem across many of these algorithms. So the lack of multi-location, multi-data set evaluation can potentially mask many uh, significant vulnerabilities or weaknesses or biases of these medical AI algorithms. So that further reinforces why it's really important to be able to quantify and to understand what data went into training and to testing each of these algorithms. Great. So now that we have a better understanding of the landscape of the data that's used to train the models, but the second step uh, is to understand, okay, let's take a particular data set. So how do the different types of data within that data set contribute to the model's behavior? To do this you know, more rigorously, what we really like to do is to establish a framework of data accountability. Right? So what I mean by that is that you know, if I take a look at the standard machine learning workflow, right, oftentimes I have some training data and I have our, my favorite learning algorithm and I achieve some performance with that algorithm. Right. So let's say if my algorithm achieves, let's say in the end, 80% you know, accuracy in deployment, in order for this entire pipeline to be data accountable, ideally, I would like to understand how much did each of the individual data points contribute to that 80% performance. Right. So mathemat mathematically, that corresponds to taking that 0.8 performance and partitioning that to each of these three example data points. Right. Similarly, if the model makes mistakes in deployment, or if it exhibits certain biases and stereotypes like we saw before, I would also like to understand you know, what is the type of data specifically that contributed or that created those biases or mistakes. Right? If I can really do this and assign responsibilities to the individual level of individual data points or individual subsets of data, then I can really have a much better understanding of you know, the accountability of this entire machine learning pipeline. That also makes it much easier for me to fix issues, to audit the system, and to create more reliable systems going forward. 
So a big aspect of the work we've been doing in my group is thinking about how do we really realize this in practice, right? So how do I take the model's mistakes or performance and then attributing that back to the individual data points? So this is the problem that we call this data evaluation problem, right? Which is exactly the problem of figuring out what is the impact or the value of each individual data point in my training part of the, in my training set for the, over the entire pipeline. So I'd like to give you a bit of an intuition for how we think about modeling and tackling this problem. So the technical details are all in the papers, which I'll link to at the end. So if we think about this problem of data evaluation, right? So the, maybe the one intuitive and natural thing we would like to try is to do some sort of leave one out kind of analysis, right? So what that means is that let's say if we're interested in this point, the middle point here is star. What I can do is I can train a model that's using all the data that I have, and I can train a model that's using all of the data minus this point star, which is taking that point out, right? And then I can try to see how does this subtraction of this data point star change the decision boundary of my model? How, how does that change the overall performance? Right, so this is actually what typically is done in machine learning and statistics. It's often called these leave one out kind of analysis of scores. And what we showed here is that it's actually these kind of leave one out analysis, even though they're very common, is that often not a very good idea because it ends up being very noisy and really doesn't fully capture and reflect the true contribution of individual data points. So what we proposed instead is this framework based on what we call the data Shapley scores. So here's the intuition of how this works. So it's very closely related to the leave one analysis, right? So what I do here is that I'll take different scenarios. Each scenario corresponds to taking a different random subset of my training data. In this example on the slide, I showed you three different scenarios corresponding to three different random sub subset of my training data. And then for each scenario, I can do this leave one out analysis, right? I can remove this point of interest star and see how does that change the model's performance for the model that's trained on that, different, on that subset. What's nice here is that I can do this across different scenarios from different random subsets, right? and this gives me a much more reliable and robust signal about what is the true impact of each individual data point. So it has a lot of nice mathematical properties. And, and at the end, I can take an average or aggregation across the, the impact of each of this data point in each of the scenarios to end up with an aggregate score for each and every data point. And this is what we call the data Shapley score, right? So the mathematical details of this you know, are, are, are uh, described more in our papers, but it's really reflected in this uh, cartoon illustration that I showed on the previous slide. So I just want to give a quick example of how this looks and how this works in practice. And again, just going back to our running example of this dermatology application. But this can be applied to NLP data, to tablet data, to other kinds of imaging data as well. So recall that in a dermatology application, right, I have some training data set, which could be quite noisy here. Right? And when I train a model on this data set and deploy that in practice, the model's performance suffers, right? the accuracy drops. That what the data Shapley score does is it actually ass assigns a score to each of my training images, right? The score can be positive or negative. The score of a training image is negative if the model believes that that image ends up contributing some noise or contributing biases to the model, right? So it ends up harming the model's performance. In contrast, training images that have a high or positive score corresponds to images that ends up having more beneficial signals or just more informative to the model's behavior. So here we can see a few random selections of examples that ends up having high Shapley scores. And so these images at the bottom here are the images that ends up having more information or cleaner images. And the ones that are filtered out are sort of the noisier or biased images. And something that's very nice and simple here is that we can simply take our original convolutional neural network model or, comp or our original computer vision model and simply retrain that model on our weighted data set, right, where the weight of each training point corresponds to its data Shapley score. Right? So it's a very simple technique. We can just reuse my original architecture, reuse this, the original data set. Only thing that we've done here is to weight each data point by the Shapley score. And just doing that simple technique already leads to quite substantial improvements in the performance of the model in deployment. Yeah, so this can be, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's useful to quantify the value and contribution of different input data points to the model's behavior.
So this idea of you now this area of data accountability and data evaluations is, I think, still very much uh, wide open. There's a lot of really exciting challenges and research being done here. There's a lot of challenges from a computational perspective, right? So it ends up that turns out that computing the Shapley scores is, can be very expensive, can take exponential many of operations. Another big challenge here is that you know, how do you create data evaluation scores that somehow accounts for the randomness and noise in the data itself, right? And we've been working on various you know, partial solutions to address these challenges. Right? We came up with sort of efficient adaptive algorithms that can quickly estimate Shapley scores. We also came up with analytic solutions to approximate Shapley scores across different conditions. So those are very fast to compute. They can be scaled to large data sets of hundreds of thousands of data points. Right? We've also introduced new notions of statistical Shapley values, which are better models of the randomness in the data. But I should be clear here that there's still a lot of room for improvements and a lot of new ideas being explored by, by different collaborators and colleagues. Great. So the third component, the third step uh, that I want to briefly describe is thinking about how do we create better uh, frameworks to evaluate our algorithms with more of human in the loop data. So the reason why this is important is because most of the time, machine learning models are actually optimizing the wrong objective. Right, so why do I say that? Because if you think about the typical ML workflow, so you have some people, maybe there could be your domain experts who curate your data sets, and then they give those data sets that are annotated to the machine learning teams and developers. Right, and then the ML team ends up spending a lot of time to take gradients and optimizing the model to optimize performance on this benchmark data set. But what we actually care about is not the model's performance on its benchmark data set, but its model's performance on the real world users, right? Which is not what this uh, iterative optimization process is optimizing for. And the reason why it's difficult and challenging to optimize the model's development for real world usage is because oftentimes this ends up being a lot of overhead to deploy the model and to collect real-time test data, real-time training data. Right, so if you think about how to deploy them, it's not enough just to train the model. We have to figure out some ways to containerize the model for different environment and compute environment settings. Often we need to have some database. And we also need to spend a lot of time to create like a web interface for different users. Right? So each step of this can be its own project, its own challenge. So to deal with this right, and to reduce the overhead, so we wanted to create uh, one single platform that can basically do all of these steps um, very simply, right? And it's done, all of this is done in Python. And the goal here is to basically make it extremely easy for someone to deploy a model to collect real-time feedback. So this work is led by my student Abu Bakr Abid. So we created this platform called Gradio. The motivation of Gradio is that you know, for almost any machine learning model, Right. With Gradio, we want to be able to create a user interface for the, for the model uh, and to start to collect feedback within 60 seconds. So here's a demo of how Gradio works. Right? So it's all in Python. You can just import Gradio like you would any other Python library. Right? And then let's say if you have a model you're trying to develop, which in this case is this uh, image classification model, I just simply use Gradio to create an interface around this model. Right, to do the interface, I simply tell Gradio the input is an image and the output will be some labels. And then I simply launch Gradio. Right, just in just these three lines of Python, we've created uh, this URL, which is a web interface for the model. Right? So this URL can be shared with any of my collaborators or, or uh, potential users or customers. And then they simply click on this URL and then that op opens up on their browser an uh, interface to interact with my machine learning model. Right. In this case, they all see an interface exactly like this, and then they can just drag and drop in their own training, you know, their own dermatology or skin images. They can modify the image and they can see how does that, uh, in real time, what is the prediction of the model. So this makes it extremely easy for us to <coughs> deploy models that are in the development stage, right? And to collect real-time feedback to these models. So we don't have to wait until the model is already deployed or close to the end. We can start to collect these feedback and user data all the way through the development stage. And this is very useful for understanding of these potential weaknesses or biases in the model. 
So Gradio is actually, we're using this now to power some of the first real-time AI trials here at Stanford. So we're running that in a Stanford hospital as we speak. It's also being used by uh, uh, over 10,000 machine learning developers and groups from the many companies, both large companies, smaller startups, as well as ac many academic groups. Right? So all of this is open source, and you can check it out just by searching for Gradio. Okay, so hopefully these, uh, the, we've given you a, a, a roadmap towards uh, building up a, this data-centric perspective on making machine learning models, AI systems more trustworthy. Uh, now I want to go back and wrap up by going back to the example that we started with, right? Our motivating mystery. The mystery, as you recall, is you know, why did this particular dermatology AI models drop so much, right? So if you recall this original reported test performance on its own benchmark data set was 0.93, so it's quite good AUC. When we tested it here at Stanford, the performance dropped off substantially to 0.6, so just barely above random. And you now by leveraging these insights that I described in the last, last uh, 15 minutes, we're able to decompose the model's drop off in, in performance to several specific factors. So the first factor that we identified that contributed to the model's drop off in performance is uh, label mistakes, right? So it turned out what happened is that we, we discovered that these models are typically trained on dermatologist annotations. And those dermatology annotations that's used to train the model came from the dermatologist visually inspecting the images, right? And those visual inspections can be very noisy, even if it's done by experienced dermatologists. But in contrast, the data here we have collected at Stanford, the annotations, the labels come from biopsy uh, and pathologically confirmed labels. So that, that's actually the ground truth, right? So a uh, reason why the model performed so poorly at Stanford, a big reason for that is that it was trained on just relatively noisy uh, labels. So second big factor we identified is uh, data shift. So the original models were mostly trained on relatively common diseases, just because that's the, where the data is easy to collect. Whereby here at Stanford, we had both common diseases and also less common diseases in our data set. So we curated it to be more representative. And that data shift also contributed to the model's drop off in performance. The third factor, which is also very important, is that these models really performed much worse on darker skin images. When we did our evaluation, we discovered that the sensitivity of these AI systems were particularly bad on images come from darker skins. Right? And the reason for that is that there's very few dark skin samples in the original training and testing data sets. Right? And these all three factors contribute to the model's drop off in performance. So I want to just want to conclude. So all of the resources and the results and papers we have here are are on my website, uh, and the code base is also on my website. I want to thank again the students, Roxana, Eric, Rimrat, and Abu for leading these efforts. So I'll stop here, um, and thanks, RT, for, for, uh, for the organizing this. Huge thank you to James for that wonderful presentation. Uh, touched on a lot of themes that were brought up throughout the day, especially, you know, Shapley or Shapley, however you say it, values that Say also mentioned in his talk. So re really great to have that as our final speaker for the day. And uh, what a fantastic day we've had so far with a number of excellent speakers telling us a lot about data-centric approaches to building machine learning applications.